Aristotle and Greek Tragedy The reality is that tragedy is meant to reaffirm the fact that life is worth living, regardless of suffering or pain that is part of the human experience. And tragedy is usually about people who are in conflict with the universe. Um, the gods in Greek tragedy, uh, for instance, um, tragedies are always about spiritual conflicts. They're never about everyday events. So, you know, if you think of it in terms of, uh, of the news, for instance, if you watch the news in the evening, um, about 95% of the news is, is fairly negative, if you think about it. And one of the reasons why the news is probably so negative is that um, we look at our own lives after watching the news and we think to ourselves, you know what, I, I'm, I'm not living in an area of the world that lacks freedom. I, I'm not um, in a, a horrible situation that's, uh, that's perilous. I'm, I'm not uh, suffering from a natural disaster, perhaps. Uh, and really, you feel better about your own life because, again, the news is often as negative as it is. Um, in most news segments, most uh, news broadcasts, there's always that positive story at the very end of the news to, you know, have you walk away certainly with a happy thought. But imagine if it was flipped. Imagine if 98% of the news was about all the wonderful things in the world that were ha that was happening. Um, you know, the uh, this person who won the Nobel Prize, that person who won the lottery, uh, this country that's doing better than your country, and so on. Um, and then you had one bad little story at the end. Um, you would feel terrible about your own life. You'd walk away from the news thinking your life was uh, worse than everybody else's around. Uh, tragedy is sort of the same way. Again, it's, it's meant to reaffirm the fact that life is worth living, uh, that your life isn't necessarily as bad, perhaps, as someone else's. Now, that said, within Greek tragedy, uh, usually the tragic hero's actions arise from uh, some sort of inner conflict, as I mentioned in the previous slide, some sort of spiritual conflict. Um, and the tragic hero within Aristotle's definition is usually defined as someone who has magnitude, um, meaning that we care about this particular tragic hero because uh, the society in which the hero exists, the fictional society in which the hero exists, cares about that hero. Um, that means that, again, you don't usually have a, a tragic hero that's an average everyday person, but instead, uh, especially in Greek tragedy, the tragic heroes often are heroes or royal uh, royals. So you'll have kings and uh, princesses and um, heirs to the throne who certainly will be or function as the tragic heroes, uh, again, because they have magnitude. The audience cares about the tragic hero because the society within the context of that tragedy cares about the tragic hero. Certainly there are other aspects of the tragic hero as well. A, a tragic hero, for instance, is not an evil person. In fact, the tragic hero is, is a good person, is a good man or a good woman uh, who is noble. He or she just isn't perfect. Um, they are flawed, and this flaw is generally referred to as hamartia or hamartia, depending on how you choose to pronounce it. Um, that said, within the context of Greek tragedy, oftentimes the, the hamartia or hamartia is specifically hubris. The Greeks believed that excessive pride was a serious problem. Um, so oftentimes, again, uh, that particular flaw that a tragic hero had within the context of Greek tragedy was hubris or, again, excessive pride. Um, Oftentimes, the tragic hero will undergo, according to Aristotle, uh, some sort of a reversal of fortune. We refer to this reversal of fortune as the peripatia. It's the fall from high to low. This is where the tragic hero, you know, perhaps is a king, but by the end of the play is not a king anymore. Um, he or she realizes uh, the flaw, the fault, and certainly uh, falls accordingly. Um, and when I say that they realize the flaw or fault, there's a name for this recognition of that uh, fall as well, because your tragic hero needs to recognize um, the mistake, the flaw that, uh, that he or she has. Uh, this is referred to as the anagnoresis, anagnoresis again being that recognition based on the, the situation the tragic hero is in. That said, inevitably, the tragic hero does fall and is punished, if you will, uh, for the flaw, for, you know, the hamartia uh, that that character possesses. Uh, generally speaking, this punishment is referred to as nemesis, which in modern day terms we think of as a, an evil character, perhaps an antagonist is a nemesis, uh, but it has its roots certainly in uh, Greek mythology and again in this idea that nemesis is, uh, again, punishment. 
And keep in mind, within Greek tragedy, uh, the nemesis or punishment for a tragic hero cannot be death. The Greeks very much believed that you needed to live with the consequences of your actions uh, in order to really understand uh, what, uh, what it means to, uh, to have a flaw and, again, to be punished by the gods for that. In addition to Nemesis, um, we as the audience view the tragic hero with usually a combination at one point or another in the play of pity and fear. Uh, we feel pity for the tragic hero because the tragic hero is, is again, nobility or is a, a famous individual. Uh, bottom line is he or she is better than we are. So we tend to empathize with that tragic hero. And we feel fear because we don't know our own future. We don't know our own fate. And uh, just as oftentimes the tragic hero does not. And as a result of that, um, we could have something that would befall us that might not be exactly like what happens to the tragic hero, but could be, uh, again, some sort of a, a, a reversal of fortune um, and a nemesis that kind of goes along with that. That said, by the end of the play, usually that pity or fear is purged away um, in something that we refer to as catharsis. It's a cleansing uh, of this pity or fear that we feel, the pity or fear that was just mentioned in the previous slide. Uh, in the case of Oedipus the King, in the exodus of the play, even after Oedipus blinds himself and we kind of feel bad for him, he still has um, a couple of uh, uh, things that he undergoes uh, that uh, a couple of things that he experiences that sort of um, suggest that he is um, uh, still hasn't completely learned his lesson with regards to what is happening. So uh, the reality is that um, Oedipus, for instance, in the Exodus at the end of the play, um, he uh, still tries to give commands uh, to Creon as far as what he needs to do. Um, he asks to be banished. He asks for his daughters, not sons, but daughters to be taken care of. Uh, he asks for Jocasta to be buried. And then at the very end of the play, he asks for his children not to be taken away from him. Uh, and Creon, of course, does not honor that uh, because Creon is now assumed control of Thebes at that point in time. So um, certainly uh, based on Oedipus actions there, he still, uh, still hasn't fully learned his place and position in society. Uh, we kind of experience catharsis, uh, the cleansing of that pity or fear, um, and feel like maybe in the end Oedipus gets what he deserves. In conclusion, the, the tragic hero really has to ask the first and last of all questions. What does it mean to be? What does it mean to exist, if you will? Um, and, you know, again, that tragic hero needs to face the world alone, uh, unaccommodated. Um, they will try and kick against their fate, which is what you see Oedipus doing, certainly at the end of the play, Oedipus the King. Um, and, you know, finally, certainly, um, the tragic hero can't really escape his or her fate, but the tragic hero will try to kind of insist upon accepting that fate on his or her own terms, um, in his or her own uh, way. And Oedipus certainly does that, not just within the end of Oedipus the King, but also uh, certainly as the play progresses into the second uh, play, uh, the follow-up Oedipus at Colonus as well. So that kind of gives you a rundown on Aristotle's definition of tragedy and the tragic hero. Uh, thank you very much, and carpe diem.